Hi everyone, welcome to this video about the HP EliteDesk 800 G3 SFF. That's a pretty long name for a rather small computer, and this one I got at an auction as well. To my surprise, when looking at the back and when I opened the machine for the first time, I saw it was equipped with an NVIDIA 1050 Ti. That was a nice bonus. As you can guess by the title, I'll do a full teardown, but after we got the system back together, let's do some testing with this card and the rest of the machine. The rest of the machine is an Intel Core i7, 8GB of DDR4 and a 256GB NVMe SSD. In the video, as mentioned, I will do a full teardown and during the rebuild I'll also be upgrading the memory to 16GB and install an additional hard disk. But first, let's start by having a look at the exterior. On the front, we see space for an optional card reader, a USB-C port, 2x USB 3 and to my surprise 2x USB 2 still, audio connections and the power button. Here you can also find a slot for the slim DVD drive. On the back of the machine we have the audio connectors, display port, flexible port option, RG45, another set of USB 2 and USB 3 ports, power connector and finally the back of that NVIDIA 1050 Ti. We can easily open up the case without any tools by moving this latch and removing the top cover. Inside we can see the power supply, CPU cooler with the CPU underneath of course, DVD drive, no standard drives, NVMe SSD, memory and the video card. To have better access to the motherboard we can easily open this part here. This gives us a better look at the NVMe drive, SATA ports and memory. To access the CPU cooler and CPU, we have to remove this plastic airflow cover. During some testing, I noticed that the CPU cooler makes an annoying sound, so I'll probably replace it as well while I'm on it. Let's start with our disassembly by disconnecting the slim DVD drive and by removing the SATA cable connected to it. Then we can simply slide it out after holding the green latch. This allows us to also remove the front panel, which clearly shows that this is not a standard ATX motherboard, but something custom. Time to remove the video card. As you can see, this Gigabyte card is a special low profile model that fits in this type of small form factor case. It has 4 gig of VRAM. Let's continue by disconnecting the power connectors. And here as well as with the motherboard, we have some proprietary connectors which you can find on some other HP models as well. It won't be very easy to replace the motherboard or power supply in this machine with a generic one. Then we can remove the NVMe SSD. followed by the installed memory. To remove the CPU cooler, we need to unscrew the four screws and we can simply lift it. This reveals the CPU which you can see is still covered in old thermal paste. Let's clean this up a bit so we can see the model number. And here it is, the i7-7700. To remove it, we can simply lift the lever and get it out of the socket. As 
Everything that was connected to the motherboard got removed, so now we can get it out of the case. We got all parts lined up nicely here, including the upgrades. We see the DVD drive, hard disk, cover for the fan, the memory, CPU fan which I will replace, video card, CPU, SSD and the motherboard. Let's have a better look at the motherboard first. As you can immediately see and notice before, this is not a standard ATX or ITX motherboard. It has four PCIe slots. The bottom one is downshifted to X4, we have 2x1 and a full X16 slot. Here are the memory banks and this is DIMM1, DIMM2, DIMM3 and DIMM4, which are channel B, channel B, channel A, channel A. Three SATA connectors, integrated front USB ports, the power button, M2 connector for Wi-Fi and another M2 connector for the SSD. We see a non-standard power input, speaker connector, and this button would reset the CMOS. Here you can find the BIOS chip itself. Further, we have the connector for the intrusion detection and case lock, and some connectors for additional serial and PS2 ports. The CPU socket, P4 connector, and CPU fan connector. Here you can find something called the option card, which could provide additional VGA, DisplayPort or HDMI output. Now that we know what we are dealing with, it's time to start the reassembly. But let's first replace that broken or noisy fan. I started with cleaning up the heatsink with alcohol to remove the remaining thermal paste. Then of course the first thing to do is to remove the current fan. The replacement fan has to be of the PWM type, with 4 pins. Other than that, it's not rocket science, so we just need to screw it back on the heatsink. Now that's been taken care of, we can start to put things together. We can start by placing the CPU in the socket. Just make sure that the orientation is correct, then we can simply insert it. The NVMe SSD just goes in the slot, then gets fixed with a single screw. Next up is the memory. As mentioned, I'll put back 2 times 8 GB instead of 1. And to make sure that we use dual channel, we need to use the same colors to have one DIMM per channel. Not much more we can do on the board, so let's get it back in the case. Now that the board is in the case, we can install the heatsink with a new cooler. As this gets fixed to the chassis, we couldn't do this while the board was out. Before we do that, let's put some fresh thermal paste. And then we can simply put back our CPU cooler.
and of course connect it to the motherboard. Next up are the power connections. Followed by the plastic airflow cover. This one simply clicks itself on the CPU fan. Then the power cables for the SATA devices and the speaker. Time to reinsert the DVD drive and connect it with the SATA cable. After that, we can prepare our standard 3.5 inch hard drive. On this one, we need to install some standoff screws. These will hold the hard disk in the drive cage. Once these are mounted, we can simply slide it in and connect the cables. We're almost done, so let's get that video card back in here as well. So far I didn't connect the hard disk to SATA, so that's the final thing to do before we can close the case. Looks like we are done with the internals, so we can reinstall the front cover. And top cover. After closing it, I connected the machine to a monitor, keyboard and mouse, so time to test and see if I did a good job with the reassembly. Looks like it's starting, so let me enter the BIOS and have a look. We see that our CPU and memory got detected as expected. And storage devices seem fine as well. Let's exit the BIOS and boot into Windows. Time to do some testing. I'll start with Geekbench, which is easy to compare with other systems. The results of the CPU benchmark look as we would expect from this CPU in comparison with other systems I tested. Let's do the same for the compute performance. This relies mostly on the 1050 Ti. Here again, everything is in line with the other systems I tested before. Interesting to see how it performs in comparison with my other system that has a 1070 Ti. This graphical card is not the fastest anymore. It actually never was but should still be quite okay for some basic gaming on 1080p. Let's start by testing performance in Microsoft Flight Simulator. As you can see, I have the settings set on medium and turn VSync off. Not that I really expect the FPS to go above 60. Let's just pick a random start and destination and start flying. Obviously, I fast forward the loading here, but in general, the loading times feel very acceptable on this hardware. Once we're in the game, it feels playable. It's not super fluent, but not disturbing either. As you can see, we get around a steady 30 FPS. Decimal 
7 Cessna X-ray Golf Sierra. Sure, Met, I have approached. There is a bit of a drop when coming closer to busy areas like Moscow here, but nothing too disturbing. What is more disturbing is the temperature of both the CPU and GPU on the other hand. These are not super as we are nearing almost 90 degrees Celsius. That doesn't look very healthy to keep over a longer time with plasma. Now let's do another test with GTA 5. This game is a bit older but should be a perfect match for this hardware. After tweaking the graphics settings you can see that I ended up with almost everything on very high with anti-aliasing enabled. During the game, this gives a fluent and very good looking experience. Uh -huh. That's Woodley with a wide Holy Get out there, ride, huh? Stop the, car. the frame rate is good and even in busy situations, like with a cop chase or with a lot of people on the streets, it never really drops below 60 FPS. Temperatures again on the other hand are, as with Flight Simulator, on the high side. Time to end the video here. This Elite Desk 800 is a nice and compact, yet still powerful machine. Even today, a few years after its release, it still does a pretty good job. Thanks a lot for watching, I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please put a thumbs up, and if you like this or similar content, don't hesitate to subscribe to my channel. I hope to see you back here soon.